What's up, Gold here? And I'm going to be going over the kind of shortish little mid range seven game main slate that we have here on uh, Monday, June 12. Um, really interesting slate here today, I think. Uh, we firstly got projections and ownership loaded up on the site already. Um, and, you know, natural disclaimers, early day stuff, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, we've got some interesting decisions I think we're going to have to make today. Um, you got a couple of arms up here at the top that we're really going to want to get to. Um, you know, notably like a, a James Paxton for building a bunch of teams. I mean, he's probably your stone lock in cash today, I would say. Everybody else above 9,000 has a good bit of upside, right? You know, Jesus Luzardo has some, even though he's um, kind of been struggling to find it a little bit recently. Um, you know, he still has plenty of raw K rate stuff in the tank. Had a very good outing in his last. Uh, we'll get into, you know, a little bit of the weeds here as we get into the games. Uh, but Bryce Miller's got some upside. He's been struggling over his last few starts, really. Uh, and we talked about this. We'll talk about more, um, Bryce Miller shenanigans, you know, when we uh, get to the final game here. Uh, he's also in play. Um, at an elevated price tag for sure. Logan Webb definitely after you know coming off a kind of a difficult outing against Colorado. Uh, Zach Eflin gets Oakland right in Oakland. So all of these guys above nine thousand really in play. So doesn't really surprise us right that all that's where most of the ownership's coming. Um, now where the real interesting decisions come is that well we we got a lot of very attackable arms down here on the bottom half. Of the pricing spectrum, right? Uh, Caprillion gets Tampa. No, thank you, right? Connor Siebold is in Boston again. Um, I say again because he was in Boston last year. Uh, that's a very difficult spot, of course. So you're probably you know, very unlikely to be playing him. Dane Dunning gets the Angels. Dane Dunning didn't strike anybody out. Neither does Tommy Henry, who gets Philly. Matt Liebertor doesn't strike anybody out. He gets San Francisco in a really interesting tournament game. Tyler Anderson has been dreadful all season. He gets Texas. Okay, Granky is Granky. He gets Cincinnati. And Luke Weaver has been pretty dreadful all season, too. Gets Kansas City. So you're not, and you can't play Matt Strong because he's just going to open at this price tag. So you don't really want to play any of these guys. I mean, at least I don't. You guys got a you know, strong take on any one of these dudes, you know, let me know. But I don't want to play any of these guys, right? So... If you want to, however, get to some very expensive offenses, though, like Tampa, like Texas, um, Philly kind of off the board against Tommy Henry, you know, whatever, like, well, you're going to have to play one of these guys because you, you're not going to be able to fit in the guys that you would like to play from those offenses and two of these top arms. You just can't do it, right? Unfortunately, we got salary restrictions. So that's where, like... Unfortunately, you're going to have to play one of these guys. So now this is where we get into the fundamentals um, and start picking things apart. Okay, would we rather play Luke Weaver or Zach Greinke or Matt Liebertor, Dane Dunning, or, you know, whatever? Um, given that, okay, well, I want to stack Tampa against Caprillion, but in order to play all these dudes like Wander and Randy and Yandy, you know, like, we got to make a decision here with one of these cheaper... you got to save money somewhere, and I don't really want to punt two and three outfield spots necessarily or something like that, right? So we're going to have to play one of these guys, and that's where the fundamental analysis that we do kind of comes into play. We combine that with the industry aggregate projections that we offer at TrueDFS, the projection and the ownership, and we try and split hairs, really. Um, and on seven game slates, I think that becomes a really interesting conversation with a lot of these guys, because as we've seen several times this season, every day we see it, there is a lot of variance in baseball and even the highest projected guys, for example, a Gosman yesterday got absolutely torn apart by the twins who had the, you know, some of the worst numbers split adjusted really all season uh, of any team on the slate. Right. And Gosman just didn't have it yesterday. Gave up four in the first inning and at 60 percent ownership, his like 
those teams were dead. Um, so there's a lot of variance here. And on seven-game slates, I think we can try and capitalize on that. So let's uh, just get into the games here and start right at the top, Colorado and Boston. This is one of the games I think you're going to have to make some decisions, right? Boston's going to be very popular today, and they probably should be. Connor Siebel, like, he was a bullpen arm for them last year, for the Red Sox, that is. And they're familiar with his arsenal. So I like taking shots. This is kind of a not totally quantifiable metric that I, I like to use sometimes. Um, pitchers against teams, or teams rather against pitchers, uh, that have you know seen the guy a lot, either like within a division, right, or... The teams like got a pretty good book on a guy because he used to pitch for him, and that you know the latter is certainly the case here. Um, so that would certainly put us on to Boston. Not like we need that extra little boost to get us to want to play Boston against Connor Seabold, right? Um, Seabold's only striking out 17% of guys this year. Good walk rate though, good barrel rate, very strong. Fly balls, right? So that's not excellent when you're pitching to this much contact. Full 82%. And some hard contact north of 32% to, to either side. That's really not good. And very high number here, 42.5 to the righties. Um, now, uh, cont contact rates can't really fake. Some of the actual results and production, it's going to be a little noisy because he's come out of uh, the bullpen several times this season for the Rockies. And he's made several starts at Coors Field, right? So um, you can't take... A heck of a lot out of these these metrics here, but you know a raw 250 batting average allowed against lefties, 282 against righties. You could take a little bit out of this, even though there's some noise still yet to flash out. Of course, it's mostly the contact numbers and the plate discipline numbers that we want to focus on when we've got short samples, right? And much more so, it's the it's the control um, rather than pitch values and, and in the arsenal and all that kind of stuff. When we've got short samples, especially with bullpen arms or guys that have had bullpen work, when we take in aggregate samples, we mostly want to focus on the numbers that converge the fastest. That's strikeout rates, that's walk rates, that's strike one rate. Um, and, it, and it's the contact rates, right? So 42.5% is undoubtedly a very large figure. 32% against the lefties, it's not, I mean, it's elevated, don't get me wrong. And it's not great. But for the most part, these numbers, given how much contact the Connor Seabold pitches to, are pretty good. And the fact that he's pitched at Coors Field a lot. I mean, yeah, he's got a 5 ERA. Okay, you know, I get it. He's got a 141 whip. I, I, I get it, right? He's pitching to a lot of contact at Coors Field. But for the most part, you know, given that context, these numbers aren't really all that terrible. As I mentioned, he's got a good walk rate here at just 8% and a very strong barrel rate. Um, he's staying off of the barrel, even though he is giving up so far a pretty worrying amount of hard contact to the right side of the plate with fly balls. Right? So that makes Boston, righties and lefties, of course, very much in play. Um, not like that was really any secret. Do we want to play Connor Siebel? Probably not. I mean, I, I don't think he's going to be all that deep for the game. Can't really take anything out of these, um, you know, the... the innings per start metrics or anything because he's got so many appearances out of the bullpen. He is stretched out, though. He's been starting for them for a good few weeks now. Um, and, in, for example, in his last outing, he went a full six innings, right? He got San Francisco. His last two outings, really, have been very serviceable. Gone five and a third against Arizona and then six against San Francisco. Five strikeouts, four strikeouts in those respective outings with limited production. Walked just, you know, a couple guys here or there, give it up. Uh, a run against Arizona and two runs against San Francisco. Now, if they could get a win for him, uh, the Rockies, that would pop him, at least in his Arizona outing, over 20 DK points. That's a serviceable outing. And he is 5,400. This is a seven-game slate. I'm not saying we're going to go out of our way to be playing Connor Seabold here because the uh, projection, even for a starter here, is minuscule. He's very likely to get picked apart pretty good. Um... Because Boston overall is still very serviceable against uh, or in plus matchups against right-handed pitching, right? They're just an average offense top to bottom. Of course, they're at stone 500 here, 33 at 33. 
every single one of these metrics, outside of maybe slightly elevated hard contact against righties, is about average, right? A little bit more power than average at a 170 ISO. And that's mostly coming from Rafi Devers, who just is starting to, looks like he's heating up a little bit um, recently. But for the most part, they're so difficult to get through because they don't strike out a lot, right? This is two and a half ticks better than average at just 20, 20 and a half percent. Walk rate is average. Woba's slightly above average, but nothing super outsized or anything like that. So for the most part, Boston is actually over a very large sample, 1,800 PAs, just an average offense against right-handed pitching. Um, so given all of these numbers against, or, or for Connor Siebel, you know, throwing four-seamer slider, that's going to give him that fly ball lean. Change up just break even here allowing him to, for the most part, suppress a little bit of production to the left-handers. I don't think he's necessarily in play. I mean, the price tag definitely puts him in play, of course, right? Uh, any starting pitcher that has a six innings in the tank in really any matchup is in play at this price tag. Um, I think you could maybe consider coming off of heavy, heavy exposures on Boston and just clicking in 60% of your teams or whatever with the Red Sox. That does not mean that, you know, we want to totally fade Boston because it's still a very good spot. He's going to pitch to a lot of contact. And he's still got some really good hitters over here that are not going to strike out. They just got Adam Duvall back as well. Um, but some of these price tags are a little hard to get to, right? Verdugo still 49, Yoshida at 57, still very expensive. Rafi Devers 58. Adam Duvall, 5,000 flat. Now, the other guys down at the bottom half of the lineup, they're going to make it cheaper. Even Justin Turner in the likely three-hole at 3,500 will make it cheaper. Um, however, there's not a lot of positional eligibility or flexibility here, I should say, for Boston. So a lot of your Boston sacks are going to be very similar, right, with Verdugo, Yoshida, Devers. These are the guys that you're probably going to want to play from the left side. You throw in a cheap Justin Turner at the top of the lineup, now all of a sudden... What, who are you going to throw in, Christian Arroyo? Yeah, you could play him at second or at shortstop. But if you want to play Reese McGuire, you know, behind the plate and, and occupy your catcher spot, you know, then you're at a very chalky team. You're going to be the exact same as all of the other stacks that do the same thing, right? So you're kind of um, pigeonholed into a similar construction at, to the rest of the field. And they're already, all of those pieces are all going to be very popular anyway. So if we want to try and balance a little bit of ownership here, I think it's reasonable to consider coming off of a little bit of Boston and trying to get different with some of these other teams. you got some other teams here we'll go over that are in very high upside spots. Uh, now, I know we're spending a lot of time on this game, but um, I think it's warranted because Boston will be the most popular today, along with Tampa. So you're going to have to make decisions on these middling slates as to how to get different with them, but also get into good plays. Like Rafi Devers is good play, right? Yoshi does good play, but they're mega expensive. And we talked at the opening that if you want to play, if you don't want to play, rather, some middling pitchers or cheap pitchers, then how are you going to make this happen playing chalky, expensive guys like Devers and chalky pitchers up at the top like James Paxton, how are you going to make this happen, right? You, well, now all of a sudden you got to punt multiple spots and in terms of price. And that kind of gets a little gulpy sometimes. So um, that said, that's kind of a long-winded way of saying, I think we can get off of a little bit of our Boston ownership here and pivot to some other teams. Now, some of these, given how much ownership is going to come to Boston and Tampa, for example, and other teams that are probably going to be a bit too popular for their actual upside, um, like a, a Royals against Luke Weaver, perhaps, or even Reds against Zach Ranke, Um, I think you can pivot to some other very high upside offenses and, and just kind of make some choices because this is a seven-game slate, and once again, there's a lot of variance in baseball. So in any case, Connor Siebold, I'm probably not going to land on this, even at 5,400, uh, but I'm probably going to try and minimize a little bit of my Boston exposure here I don't trust the offense all that much, to be quite honest. They're just an average offense. And I think Connor Siebold is serviceable enough to last five innings here. Do I want to go after the, the Colorado bullpen? Yeah, I, I kind of do. Uh, they're getting starting to get gassed a little bit. So, I mean, 
I'm not going to fade Boston or anything, but I might come in a little under the field here and just get to some other teams that I that I like. Um, probably going to end up doing that with Paxton as well, even though this is a very, very good spot. I'm less likely to do it with Paxton here. Uh, however, Paxton's got some underlying noise here in his early season metrics, or his early season. 9300 the price tag's fine in this particular spot, right? Very high projection and commensurate very high ownership, of course. So he's going to lead the way. He's the most chalky arm of the day. Um, and he really should be. This is, a, I think, a, a lock in cash. As close to a lock as we can get in baseball. Um, because this is an incredible matchup. Against lefties this season, Rockies have been dreadful. This is by far the worst split-adjusted WRC Plus number on the day. 27% K rate. That's tied for the highest rate with another team that we'll get to later on. 285 Woba, make a little bit of hard at 32%, but like whatever. It's the line drive rate that really keeps them serviceable and really prevents this WRC Plus number from being far lower than it actually is. Now, over the last little while, I've been looking for a Rockies bounce against left-handed pitching. Could we do that against Boston tonight, or against Paxton, rather? I think that's in play. He's only got 59% strike one. That's not an elite figure here, even though he's he does have the 33% K rate. That is an elite figure, of course, as is a 14.5% swing strike rate. 31% CSW is great. 79.5% strand rate is high. And long-term for Paxton, it's probably not sustainable anymore. So this is likely to continue to drift downward. So far, he's been pretty good. Where where you get a little bit worried, right, is how many fly balls he's given up here. He's always been a fly ball pitcher. 050 ground ball to fly ball here in the early going against his 110 hitters with a good bit of hard contact, 44% nearly against the right side of the plate. Hasn't translated to average yet, really, or power, but this is not going to persist, right? 44% hard contact with an 050 ground ball to fly ball and a 27% line drive rate against righties. These power numbers at just a 164 ISO allowed, they're going to skyrocket if those contact numbers persist now are they likely to come down in this particular matchup yes because the Rockies are so bad against left-handed pitching have been this season uh, they've been a little bit better recently their offense has you know, just kind of an aggregate with Ryan McMahon having really gotten going they brought up Nolan Jones he's been excellent since they brought him up hitting 350 showing some power He's the one who hit the walk-off bomb for them last night. Ryan McMahon hit a game-tying homer in the ninth inning in a downpour. Um, and Zeke Tovar really coming into his own. Watching this kid play as often as I can, you can see the growth that he's making at the play. He's only 21. They're likely to have him in the two-hole tonight because they just lost Charlie Blackman, who's got a busted hand. They're going to be able to go very right-handed heavy tonight are the Rockies. With probably eight righties in the lineup, they just brought up another high upside hit tool for them, Coco Montez. He'll be in there at second base. Can't play him, unfortunately, because DK doesn't have any idea what they're doing, uh, and he's still not in the player pool. So they'll have anywhere from seven to eight, uh, yeah, seven to eight righties in the lineup, depending on what they want to do with McMahon and Nolan Jones. So batted ball-wise, this is a little, because Paxton gives up a little bit, a few too many line drives here, 27%. That's a high upside spot for some of these right-handers. And if you want to come off of a little bit of Paxton, we saw yesterday with the Gosman shenanigans that any starting pitcher, when you, when you eat this much ownership on them, whether it's a good play or not, there's still variance with them, right? And whether they have good numbers and, and all this kind of stuff, he's got a 12.5% barrel rate, right? So with a lot of fly balls, a lot of line drives, hard contact – and a 12.5% barrel rate early. He's only got 29% O-swing rate here. You know, these are attackable figures, and we kind of go after this sometimes. So it's within range that a couple of these right-handers here from the Rockies can get to Paxton, and this is in a hitter's ballpark. It's obviously not Coors Field or whatever. It's still Fenway, and it's still 75 degrees, and it should be a good night for baseball. So it's reasonable if you want to play some Rockies on the other side. Zeke Tovar, cheap shortstop piece, 3,500. Like I said, he'll likely be at the top of the lineup. You can play Ellaris Montero. He's very cheap. He's got a lot of power. Very likely to strike out a good bit in this matchup, however. And you can consider like a Brenton Doyle or something like that. Um, high upside power and speed combination. So I... 
probably wouldn't get after full stacks of the Rockies unless I ended up with a, a lot of James Paxton uh, or his ownership steams to north of you know 50, 60 percent. It will in some context. So contest. So go ahead and stack the Rockies in three mans, four mans, two mans. You know you can get to full five mans if you want. This is just a seven game slate. Um, so I do like Paxton here. I'm going to have a, a, a good bit. I'm not sure how many teams I'll build tonight, but this 9,300 here in this particular matchup, it's a good spot. I think both the Rockies and Paxton are in play. Certainly the Red Sox in play, probably just going to stay off of the Seabold here tonight. Um, but I think three sides here rather than just the two of Paxton and Red Sox are really in play. So I know we spent a lot of time on that game, but this is one of the ones I think you're going to have to get right in tournaments tonight to... Um, to really succeed. So let's move on to San Francisco and the, and the Cardinals. I think it's a really interesting tournament game here. Logan Webb, he's going to see some ownership, of course, because he's one of the better arms on the day. 10-3, I think this is a an attainable price tag. It's going to be hard to get to expensive offenses with him, of course. Um, but I think this is a fine matchup. He still has a very high ground ball to fly ball ratio at, at 240 to 1 in aggregate, basically to both sides. Um, he got he's coming off, as we mentioned, a, a little bit of a rough outing in Colorado where he only lasted about five and a third, gave up four runs. And that was early in that start. Took him a little bit to settle in and didn't have any of the strikeout stuff. So he just didn't have his best stuff. He walked a couple guys, which is mostly uncharacteristic for Logan Webb. Overall, in aggregate, the numbers here this season are still really damn good. 69% strike one rates elite. 5% walk rate is elite. 25% strikeout rate, not elite, but it's well above average. 36% chase rate and a 30% CSW here. Bucko nine whip. I mean, this, this is all excellent for Logan Webb. Nothing wrong with him. It's just a kind of a cold outing for him uh, at Coors Field. And we can't really blame him for that necessarily. How we want to attack Logan Webb on the other side, if we do that, is mostly with left-handers. Strikeout rate is lower, and it'll give up a little bit more hard contact to them. 34% as opposed to 27.5% to the right side. Ground ball rate a little bit lower, so it is only fly ball hitters and line drive hitters from the lefties that we'd like to get to. But he doesn't give up a lot of line drive himself. So kind of hard to attack there. Um, with some of these left-handers like a Nolan Gorman or Brendan Donovan, um, I mean, you really don't want to play Tommy Edmond from the left side necessarily. Down, Certainly not a 4,200 down at the bottom of the lineup. And, I mean, do you really want to play Dylan Carlson? Yeah, I mean, he's 2,400. It's okay price-wise, but this is not the greatest batted ball matchup. Do you want to play Goldschmidt at 55 and Nolan Arenado at their normal price tags in a down matchup for them? Probably not, even though they don't strike out a lot, make a lot of contact, and they're really good hitters against righties too down matchup for them nevertheless so um i think we got a side with logan webb here of course field kind of doing the same at 24 percent ownership so far but i have no problem with this getting to you know getting off of some of the paxton if, if you can make a team like that happen a construction like that happen i think getting up to a logan webb and off of 20 percent of that ownership i think that's a pretty damn good play if you can make that happen um so I've got no problems getting to Logan Webb here. I'm kind of off of the Cardinals. And value-wise, since they're at their normal price tags in a down matchup, they're not popping all that hard in value so far. So Matt Liebertor on the mound from them, 6,400. He's going to see a little bit of ownership here today. It's mostly just because of the price tag. But I want to play the Giants on the other side. Um, I was hoping that his ownership would be higher than this so we could actually get some decent leverage on it. Um now, that kind of takes me off of San Francisco a little bit because Liebertor is still a serviceable arm here, right? He's got five pitches that he's using. None of them all that excellent so far. Sinker's been good, and that's neutralizing, helping neutralize a lot of the power that he would otherwise give up to the right-handers. We got a short sample here just in three stars for uh, for Liebertor. And these numbers are very likely to come up. Just a 114 ISO allowed to the right side here. With the changeup, he's not throwing all that much, maybe about 5 8% to the lefties. It, he's mostly mainlining four-seamer, two-seamer, curveball slider. So he's got breaking stuff here. and But without a changeup, he's probably going to struggle to get whiffs and a lot of soft contact against the right side of the plate. And that's why we see a very elevated hard contact rate, pushing 42% nearly in this short sample. So... 
Concerns for Librator here, 15.5% aggregate strikeout rate. That's really to both sides so far. Uh, again, short sample, but an 11% walk rate, 46.5% strike one rate. This is not good. And how we want to go after the Giants usually is with guys that could throw it past them. Their weakness is strikeouts. And if, if you don't have anybody that's going to get ahead in counts, you're going to put them in favorable spots. So I want to get to some of the Giants here and play some of these right-handers. I think some of these guys are in very equitable spots. What does have me a little bit concerned is that most of them, uh, unfortunately, from the right side, are not as heavy fly ball hitters as they are from the left side. For example, with like the Jock Petersons, the Yastrzemskis, and all that kind of jazz. Right From the right side, you got the Austin Slaters, the Tyro Estradas, uh, the J.D. Davis types of, types of guys that are not... Um, they're a little bit more ground ball lean. So that does, batted ball-wise, play a little bit into Librator and to, and to his favor. However, I'm not going near this 46.5% strike one rate. I think this is very, very dangerous. This is the one number that jumps way off the page for me in a short sample because that's the number that converges the quickest, right? Uh, he, of course, has a very low strand rate, kind of noisy high barrel rate in a short sample, perhaps a noisy high bear, or a walk rate in a short sample as well. Um, you know, we need to see this flesh out a little bit more. So we can't really take anything out of the out of the pitch values or anything like that yet. But it's the strike one rate that really has me concerned. Um, and I think the field is kind of agreeing here. At 6,400, there's a guy a little bit cheaper that the field's probably going to want to get to. And I think I agree with that. Um, I'm not sure. Now, if this ownership totally drifts off the board and gets to 5% or something like that, I think that's when you could probably take some shots on him. But at 10% or so, I'm not super interested there. Um, even though the Giants against left-handed pitching are a below average offense in creation, just 94 WRC plus with the high strikeout rate, low hard contact rate, low power. I think some of these guys have some upside, in particular Tyro Estrada, Wilmer Flores, Mitch Hanniger types today. Uh, Casey Schmidt, for sure, is a, is a fine play. Austin Slater as well. Uh, so I'm not super jacked about the high ground ball rate that Libs has so far. Um, but I think that puts the Giants in play as a deeper tournament stack. Okay, let's uh, let's move on since we're kind of yapping here. Angels, Texas. Um, I'm not playing Tyler Anderson, I can tell you that much right now. I think Texas is, man, it's, it's top three, certainly, with them, the Dodgers, and... Um, and Tampa, and honestly, I think Texas may very well be the best of of the three there. Now, I know that Tampa and the Dodgers hit for a little bit more power and whatever, but top to bottom, I think the Rangers here are the most difficult lineup to get through uh, in baseball. It's just every damn one of them gets on base, and every damn one of them can hit for some power. They've got speed that they can mix in with their bench guys as well. They're just incredibly versatile. This is a super, super dangerous team, and I'm not going near Tyler Anderson. I don't care if it's 4.5% ownership. Uh, I'm not touching him. So I want to get to Texas, and they're actually likely to be quite down the board today in terms of ownership. So that's when I want to jump on board. I, they're very expensive. In order to get to Semi and Seager, Adelise Garcia, uh, you got to pay for these guys, 58, 59, and 5,500 respectively. Now, Josh Young, I think he's the best player of the team at 4,600. That, that's a much more palatable price tag than his north of 5K number that we've seen recently. Nate Lowe hits lefties great at 4,500. It's a fine play. And any either of the catchers, we like Jonah Heim from the right side for sure. And Mitch Garver has fantastic numbers over the last several seasons against left-handed pitching. He's a very high fly ball hitter with a lot of power. Um, Zeke Duran got really good numbers against right, uh, lefties. Leody Tavares, not so much in the power, but he's got some speed, high contact bat. So literally top to bottom, Robbie Grossman's a switch hitter. Um, no matter who they put in here, they're going to be very tough out. So I think Tyler Anderson is super likely to struggle today. This projection honestly looks a bit high um, to me here in the early going. He's got a very low strikeout rate this season. Super high walk rate. He's had good control in the past, but this walk rate is, has spiked pretty significantly. It's up to 11% this year. He's staying off the barrel, which is nice, right? But he's still got very high fly ball rates to the right side of the plate. Line drive rate as well. 
um, is pretty concerning. Now, he's always historically in, induced a, a good bit of soft contact, mostly with the cutter to right-handers. And we see that it's 23.5%. That's a good number soft contact-wise with just a 27% hard rate. Um, that makes him, you know, that would be the only number, the only figure here that would take me off of a little bit of, or going so heavy on, on the Texas right-handers. Uh, but given their very likely ownership and being, I don't know, fourth or even fifth on the board in ownership today, I think that's a smash play. Like I said, I think this is the most difficult lineup to get through in all of baseball. That includes the Dodgers. So, um, I want to get to as much Texas as I can here today, and I'm not going to I'm not going to deal with these 6,800 Tyler Anderson shenanigans. On the mound for the Rangers is Dane Dunning, 6,100, and he's he's the guy that's going to see the ownership down here in the low 6K range, as opposed to Matt Liebertor. Um You'll probably see this hover around 15%. I like this price tag for Dunning. I don't like the raw whiff stuff that he offers. Uh, I do like the suppression though. However, we've got some noise coming here so far. Like, he, he's got a lot of appearances out of the bullpen. He's been a starter here for the last little while, however, and he's stretched out. He has seen the Angels once already this season, and he was serviceable in that outing. Went, uh, let's see, pulling it up here on the other, uh, on the side here. He went five full innings, struck out just three, didn't give up any production. Um, and that's, you know, a serviceable 15 point DK outing at the same price tag. And he's kind of hovered in this 6K range. He popped over his last couple outings to mid 7Ks or whatever. Um, I think that's a bit aggressive, those $7,000 price tags for Dunning, given how much contact he pitches to still, 82.5% here, 15% K rate. He's not going to walk anybody. He's going to stay off of the barrel. And he gets ground balls. So that puts him in play at 6,100 here. Um, I am a little bit worried about going after a guy like Mike Trout, for example. Um, now he's expensive and Trout's really been struggling this season to kind of find it. Um, he's obviously Trout still, and if he were hot, like his numbers would be far, far better. And, um, you know, Trout would be a perpetual 6,800 hitter every single day. He's really, I mean, he's only hitting 240 or 250 or whatever it is this year. And the power numbers are still there, right? Still hitting doubles, still hitting the baseball over the wall, but it's not with the same regularity that it, he's striking out a lot. Um, however, he's still got a really, really good hit tool, and Dane Dunning's not going to throw it past him all that regularly, right? Just a 14% strikeout rate against the right side of the plate. Still giving up hard contact here and with a buck fifty ground ball to fly ball against right handers. Trout's a fly ball hitter. And with this two seamer slider mix Dane Dunning tries to stay down in the strike zone against right-handers and that plays right into Trout's powerhouse so he's the one guy I'm really worried about of course you got to worry about Shohei um, but Dane Dunning's cutter here has been fantastic this season he's getting a lot of rollover very weak kind of medium contact uh, against left-handers it's been very very good change up just break even but he throws a two-seamer, so it's pretty likely that the changeup's not going to be all that great when it's only a four- and five-mile-an-hour velo delta off of the two-seamer. So, um, you know, given that context, changeup's actually been a pretty damn good pitch for him, too. So he's got a four-pitch, very serviceable arsenal here, uh, really against both sides of the plate, not getting a lot of whiffs. So that's what concerns me when I want to click in a lot of uh, 6,100 Dane Dunning here. But he's the guy... Like I said, we, we're going to have to make decisions here today and play some cheap guys, and he's probably the one I'm going to land on the most. I would assume that I probably get, if I were to run teams right now, I'd probably get north of this 15% ownership, and I'd probably come in 20, maybe even 25, depending on how hard I click in the expensive offenses, like Tampa and like Texas. Um, you know, So that's kind of my hunch and where I'd land with him. I think it's an opportunity to get a little bit of leverage on the field. You don't want to go too crazy with this because it's still a seven-game slate. It's still a very decent offense over here. 108 WRC plus against righties, 180 ISO, 33% hard contact, just an average strikeout rate, and a neutral ground ball to fly ball. So you're going to hit the baseball hard and in the air and on a line. And batted ball-wise against Dane Dunning, that's uh, that's attackable. So um, I like Dunning a little bit here at the price tag mostly. If the ownership drifts 
too high, then I probably pivot it to like Levertor or something like that. So I think we're going to have to make some game theory decisions um, on the mound down this low 6K range. But I really, really like Texas here today. I'm not dealing with any of Tyler Anderson. And I'll have some angels, of course, of the guys you want to play on the other side as some coverage. Okay, we're going kind of long here on these first three games. Let's see if we can speed it up. Unfortunately, I don't know if we're going to speed it up here. Like, both of these arms here to uh, in the, the Reds and Royals game, like, these are in play. Uh, 7500 for Luke Weaver. I'm not super jacked about this price tag. He's given up a lot of hard contact still. Um, now, the, the homer per nine number, that's noisy. ISO numbers, probably a little bit noisy since he's had some some outings in, in Great American, which is a high school field. Um, it's mostly the barrel rate here, right? That at 11%, that's a very worrisome figure, super high number. Uh, second on the day, I believe, to James Paxton, who we already talked about. 22.5% K rate, though, against the Royals. That puts him in play. Um, that's an average number. So, you know, it's a tick below average, whatever. But 65% strike one is a very good number, and he doesn't walk people. So... The fly ball lean here, I'm not super crazy about, and the hard contact, I'm really not crazy about. But I do think the ISO numbers here in the, I mean, it's not a super short sample, but short-ish sample uh, are probably a little bit outsized um, and a little bit noisy. However, this is still Luke Weaver, and he's still not going to wow us with stuff necessarily. But we can just look at a 6.5 ERA, give or take. He's got expected metrics two runs lower than that. So a little bit of noise coming through so far perhaps looking for a little bit of positive regression for him. So if we land on some middling offenses, perhaps like a Philly or an Arizona um, or something like that, or even a correlated Reds team, you might even land on a, a 7,500 Luke Weaver against Royals. Royals are dreadful against right-handed pitching. We've been attacking them all season. Tick and a half above average, nearly two ticks, 25% K rate against righty 78 WRC plus it's the hard contact rate for the Royals here that I'm really concerned with when I play a, a good bit of Weaver of course but they're only hitting for a, a buck 50 ISO that's an average number neutral ground ball to fly ball that's encouraging for the Royals but they're popping up a lot of balls here a full 11 percent infield fly ball rate so um, I think that puts Luke Weaver in play he is serviceable enough to last six innings here against Royals because this offense stinks and even though they're popping very hard in value, it's mostly because they're they're cheap. You got to pay for Bobby Witt, you got to pay for Salvi, but every other one of these guys is 3K or less outside of Nick Prado, who is 3,100. So they're good filler stacks because they're super super cheap and they have upside in this particular matchup uh, against Luke Weaver at those price tags. So that puts them in play. But I think I might come off a little bit of the Royals and might end up getting to a little bit of Luke Weaver. I think the projection here and the ownership numbers and and really the underlying metrics that kind of put me on to him a little bit in this matchup this is a bad baseball team over here at Kansas City and they don't really have a lot of upside so I think that puts him in play same thing with Grinky on the other side 7,000 not super thrilled about this price tag necessarily I respect the Reds offense definitely now with Ellie Delacruz up um, a hell of a lot more than I respect the Royals offense and the numbers kind of back me up there, right? 91 WRC plus, average K rate, 23%. They walk more. Don't hit, I mean, for near as much hard contact, you're about five, what is that, eight ticks lower, seven ticks lower than the Royals. So that's definitely uh, in the Royals' favor. And no power, really, but I still respect them because they'll take more professional at-bats and they're more patient at the plate. That's a full 3% higher walk rate for the Reds compared to Kansas City, and they create because... Now with guys with speed up at the top of the lineup, TJ Friedel is back, even though they lost Jake Fraley, a good power hitter for them. Matt McClain has speed. Johnny India has speed. Ellie De La Cruz has probably the most speed in all of baseball. Um, Will Benson's got a little bit as well. So these young hitters at the top of the lineup make them a, a very difficult list to get through sometimes with a guy that's not going to blow it past him. Now, Granke, I hate stacking against him because he gives up three runs every outing, and he goes five innings, and he strikes out one. Um, and that's pretty much who Zach Granke is. But I think on a seven-game slate here with, like, I think Ellie De La Cruz is one of the best value plays of the day, even at 4,300. I think he's a really, really good spot for him. Uh, with Granke only throwing 42 miles an hour here, He's going to be able to steal second and steal third. He might do it on the same damn pitch. So 
I like getting to some reds if I can. That's who I'd side with as opposed to Granky, but he's still in play because of the price tag here, and we don't really have anybody else we want to play. So um, since he is a serviceable and professional arm here, he still has enough in the tank to pick through what is a very young lineup. Uh, there are a couple of these guys, like an Ellie Dela Cruz, they're still, still going to be a little bit undisciplined at the plate and strike out a lot. Um, but that doesn't mean I, I don't want to play the Reds. I want to side with them most often here. But getting a little bit of Zach Greinke, I think I'll, I might land on that. And 5.5% ownership, I think he has upside for 15 to 20 points here. And you can capitalize on that and get a little bit of leverage. At, at the very least, get into the field here with a Greinke or two. Uh, because really nobody down in this what 7k range you're all that excited about so you may as well you know click in a guy that you know uh is very likely to stay within a, a pretty confined range and not get blown up all that often in Grinky. so i think he's in play i think the reds are in play for sure and i think luke weaver is in play and absolutely don't get me wrong the royals are definitely in play as well mostly due to their price tags uh and it's a fine spot because weaver gives up a lot of contact uh, okay, so everybody in play in that game, probably not so much when we move on to Tampa and Oakland, almost exclusively just Tampa here. However, you know, at 5,200 for Caprillion, I mean, you're not playing him, number one. Like, I don't play pitchers against Tampa, um, and I'm definitely not playing a guy that only has a 19% K rate and a 13% walk rate. That's not happening. So Tampa's definitely, if not number one, they're number two on the day. Um, in in top stacks. I mean, Texas is my top stack, but it's pretty damn close between Boston, Tampa, and Texas, I think. And you can go after Cap, for sure, because he's very attackable. However, historically, he's been pretty hard to stack against because he's a fly ball pitcher, heavy fly ball pitcher, that pitches most of his games in Oakland. And sure enough, we are in Oakland here tonight. Um, he's really gotten this season under, under control, the barrel rate, right? Six and a half percent now. This is half of what it was last season the walk rate is still a problem and he's still not throwing it past anybody so that that's an issue if he starts walking people like he's going to pitch to so much contact at a full 78 percent this year it's you know four ticks five ticks lower than it was last year but still a big number 77 78 percent tampa is going to be able to pick him apart if he starts walking people right so um super dangerous spot to be going anywhere near near Caprillion at 5,200, the price tag would put him in play in a lot of matchups. This is not one that, that he's in play. However, look at this projection compared to Connor Siebold, who's 200 more expensive. He's got what? 60%, 70% higher projection than Connor Siebold. 11 points is a serviceable number at 5,200, right? That's a full two Oh point per dollar here. Um, like I said, he is difficult to stack against sometimes because he gets so many fly balls and he suppresses some contact when he stays off of the barrel. He's got a, a good five pitch, I, I say a good five pitch mix, good only in terms of quantity, not necessarily quality, but he has five pitches that he can go to bat with and that makes him a little frustrating to go after. If we're looking for some positive regression for Cap, he's got a seven ERA. With an XERA 5.5 and, and an XFIP, yeah, it's north of 6. Um, but it's still a run lower than a ZRA, right? So uh, we could potentially see with the lack of excessive barrel rate contact here a little bit of positive regression for him. He's been pretty good against right-handers this year, even though he's still given up a 35% hard contact. We're okay with this when he's getting this many fly balls. Um, it, it's a little worrisome, of course. But it's that four-seamer slider mix that really keeps these guys from hitting it over the wall on him, at least from the right side of the plate. It's the lefties that you mostly want. And, you know, good news for Tampa, they're going to be able to go very left-handed heavier. They've got a lot of guys from the left side of the plate that are in incredible batted ball matchups tonight. So Tampa, for sure. You could play the righties, too. Don't get me wrong. Um, and we don't, we're going to want to get to as much as we can here. But don't forget, this is in Oakland, and Cap is a fly ball pitcher, heavy fly ball pitcher. So... You could see some downside of the variance with Tampa here tonight, and when they don't hit the baseball over the wall, um, in that in that sense, if you get there with full stacks, you're going to need full stacks, and it's probably less likely that uh, that one-offs get there for you, unless they you know just run into a ball here or there. So, um, you know, there's 
it's not just a an automatic sl- smash play necessarily. You can consider, given this batted ball profile, coming off a little bit of Tampa here. But um, you know these line drive rates north of 22 percent with hard contact. That very much puts them in play. Once again, this is, you know, top three offense in baseball. Oakland on the other side, I don't really want to deal with them tonight. However, they're still very cheap, and we're still going to be playing them. You know, they're they're all under 3,000 um, outside of Asteria Ruiz at 3,400, and he leads the majors in stolen bases. So, sure. Zach Eflin's 11,000, man. I, I know he gets Oakland. I know he's been pretty okay this season, but he's been a lot more enigmatic than a guy – that's breaking out like a Nathan Eovaldi, for example. Um, 11,000 is not not cheap here, and that's what's keeping his ownership number down. I think it makes him a fine tournament play up there with Logan Webb. I'd probably prefer to get to Logan Webb in a more difficult matchup. Um, But I I think they're kind of a wash, to be quite honest. Eflin has a little bit of susceptibility in getting taken apart here. He's been a a lot more up and down, and at the beginning of the season, he was 74, 7,500 or whatever at the, after his first start. He's 11,000 now, and if we look at his results, I'm not totally sure that he's fully warranted this, um, this outrageous price jump all the way from the low 7,000s. Now, he has had a couple of games where he's popped for um, some really high numbers, you know, 35 in his last outing or, or whatever it was, Um so that, yeah, sure, that that's fine. And this is Oakland, don't get me wrong. But uh, I think it's reasonable if you, construction-wise, come off of this. Um, not that I'm scared of going after Oakland or anything, but I think playing a little bit of Oakland on the other side, Seth Brown, Ryan Noda, uh, Asturi Ruiz, of course, Ramon Laureano's been pretty decent lately. He's at 2,500. You play Jace Peterson's got pop. You play J.J. Blade, he's got pop. Um, you know, they're a playable pieces here if you want to sort of leverage some of this 30% ownership on Zach Eflin or really any right-handed pitcher that gets uh, gets the athletic. So uh, I think that's in play. Some of these guys for Oakland, Eflin's of course in play because this is Oakland. Um, but I think if I had to choose, it'd be mostly just Tampa offense here. No cap for me. I just don't think he's going to have really all that much upside. Uh, would I be shocked if he pops for 20 and has a good outing here? I mean, kind of, but not overly shocked because, once again, this projection here for a guy down at this price tag is pretty damn high considering the matchup that he's got so far. So um, everybody pretty much in play here, I think, but certainly the favorite's got to be Tampa. Uh, Okay, Philly and the Diamondbacks, really good tournament game here, I think. Um, Matt Strom's just going to open for them, so it's going to be Dylan Covey coming in afterward. He's a right-hander. Don't have him in the sheet. Should have just put him in here, but... Um, I think that plays into Arizona's skill set here a little bit. He is a below-average right-hander, and we like Arizona against below-average right-handers, even though the, against lefties, um, you know, these a- these numbers are just average. They're basically the same against righties, so we could just kind of use those numbers down here. They don't strike out a lot, right? They strike out sub-20%. That's three ticks above average. They hit for more power. And against right-handers, as you can see, including the numbers against lefties at just a 163 ISO against the left-handers. In the 2,500 PA sample against everybody, that ISO number ticks up a full 1, 1% here to 17, uh, 17% power numbers, right? So um, that suggests that the ISO number against right-handers is north of 180 or so, give or take. So they, they get on base a little bit more and strike out a little bit less and make more hard contact. So I want to get to some Arizona if I can in some tournaments here. They're going to be totally off the board, and they really shouldn't be. This is a very good spot for them, and this is a good baseball team, man. They're 15 games above 500, and they're right up there with the Dodgers as one of the better teams in the National League. I think it's a good, good baseball team and a very high upside spot for them against Philly. Um, this is a good tournament game down here. If you want to stack this game and, and if you can make it happen, uh, I, I'm fully on board. I'm going to see if I can make some constructions like that. You can play some of these righties like a Lord S. Gurriel or a Christian Walker. They'll probably be in the lineup tonight um, just to get some exposure to the Matt Strom, who's likely to go a couple innings here. Um, so you might see a full time through the lineup, perhaps, before Dylan Covey comes in. Um, 
So it might be a little bit difficult to get some Arizona stacks that are super balanced and ones that you like being able to attack the lefty and Matt Strom here, who's very good uh, against left-handers. He gives it up a little bit against righties, of course. But, um, you know, Dylan Covey, like I said, he's an average right-hander, and he's not going to wow us with stuff necessarily. So uh, you could play some of the righties and still feel okay with it. Um, unfortunately, if Corbin Carroll's in, like, the two-hole, at you're probably sacrificing uh, one of his at bats, unfortunately, he's, and he's expensive. So, you know, there's some decisions you got to make with an Arizona stack um, that are going to be kind of queasy, you know, uh, going after what's effectively kind of a bullpen game here with uh, with Strom and Covey. So um, that doesn't take me off of them, you know, by any means, because like I said, this is a really, really good offense down here in plus matchups. And I think this is overall at least against Dylan Kobe, a plus matchup. Uh, Tommy Henry on the mound uh, for the D-backs. He didn't strike anybody out. 14% K rate, and I know he had a good outing against Colorado, but that's Colorado, and they're dreadful against lefties. Um, and sure enough, in his last outing against Washington, he got beat up, went four and a third, gave up five earned, struck out just two. So I think we're going to see something kind of similar here against Philly, this is a very dangerous offense, even though this season, 26% strikeout rate, 91 WRC+. plus. They still create a little bit because they got a lot of guys that hit the baseball over the wall. They did just get Alec Bohm back, who has incredible numbers against left-handers. He's going to be the favorite play for me from the Phillies tonight at first and third base eligible. Um, JTR behind the plate, he's got really solid numbers against lefties. I think this is very playable at 4,800. You probably see more ownership on a guy like uh, Salvador Perez, for example. So I think that makes him a good tournament pivot. Trey Turner, very high upside spot for him to get off the schneid a little bit. 5,400, playable price tag. You got to pay for Philly, which is really what's going to keep their ownership down and kind of take me off of a lot of my exposures here. But that's it's not a, you know, due to the fundamental spot or anything. Henry's got a 10% walk rate and, as we mentioned, a 14% strikeout rate. Um, he's just not going to throw it past these guys, and unfortunately, that's really how you need to attack Philly because, for example, against lefties, Schwarber's got a 30% strikeout rate. It's pushing 40 this season. Uh, Bryce Harper's got a 30% strikeout rate against left-handers, too. So there are they're power hitters here that you're really worried about are much better... Uh, against right-handers, and they are lefties. Uh, but you need guys that can throw it past them from the left side if you are going to really attack guys like Schwarber and Harper. And, and Schwarber has been really heating up recently. So I think he's a very good tournament play here tonight uh, in the downside of his platoon because Tommy Henry's not going to throw it past him. Um, I like this a good bit. About a neutral ground ball to fly ball here that plays very well into a what's a a neutral ground ball to fly ball aggregate for the Phillies here uh, against lefties, about a buck 20 ground ball to fly. This is a very dangerous spot for Tommy Henry. Uh, I think you could see a lot of runs scored in this game, and I think it's a really cool tournament game. So uh, no pitching here for me, and uh, I'm going to try and get to as much offense as I can. Okay, last game here. Let's go to uh, Miami and Seattle. Jesus Luzardo, you know, if we're pivoting off of uh, James Paxton, this is the guy I think I'd want to get to. However, his ownership starting to steam, too. Um, so I'm not really fooling anybody. He's got a 28% K rate this season. His problem over his last several starts, uh, really since the early part of the season, um, has been against right-handers, right? He went on about a 10 or 12 game. Let's see, 2, 4, 6, 8. Yeah, about a 10-game stretch where he maxed out at about 22 DK points. Was really struggling to find it. The production against him was really there. The strikeout stuff has never really waned. Um, he's had one start in those last 12 outings where he struck, uh, excuse me, three starts, where he struck out less than six guys, and he struck out five, right? So he's still going six innings, five innings in a couple of the games where he gave up some production, but he's still stretched out enough, still throwing a lot, and... You know, as we were kind of talk discussing in the Discord yesterday, he probably isn't going to be one of those guys that um, has a short leash here. So if he's pitching well, they're just going to let him run. And this is a very good matchup for a high upside left-hander with very good strikeout stuff. And against, like, Seattle here, like, they're dreadful. This is the other team up there with Colorado in terms of 
raw strikeout rate. They got the highest split adjusted number on the day. Now, Seattle's going to create a little bit more because they got better hitters against left handed pitching. But Jesus Luzardo, I would say, is probably still better, a better arm than James Paxton. I trust Luzardo a little bit more than I trust Paxton. Um, you know, both of these matchups are, are fantastic, and that's why we're seeing such high ownership on both of these guys. All right, you're going to see north of 50 and probably 60% on Paxton in a lot of contests. You'll probably see the same thing with Luzardo. The inverted price scale here for 9600 at, at um, or at 9600 for Luzardo and 93 for Paxton, that'll probably keep the ownership on Luzardo a little bit down. Um, so if I, in, in tournaments, if I... I'm looking for a pivot or I've got an extra 300 bucks just kind of floating around. I think getting to Lazardo is perfectly fine. I don't have any gripes with this whatsoever. It's the right-handers that he's, as I mentioned, struggling with a little bit. 210 ISO allowed with a 274 average, kind of a big number there. 37% hard contact with an 070 ground ball to fly ball. You don't want any of the lefties here against him, so that takes me off of a Kelnick and a J.P. Crawford or, or whatever the hell they do um, from the left side. And... You know, if you want to leverage some some of this high Luzardo ownership with some Seattle pieces, even though they do strike out, they still will create. And if Luzardo is, you know, on the barrel a little bit here, he's got 11% barrel rate himself. There's some guys that might be heating up over here, like a Julio Teoscar Hernandez. He's 3,100. Um, he might be starting to see the baseball a little bit better. Ty France is 3,600. Um, you can play Gino Suarez, who still has pretty decent numbers against lefties. He's 39, not my favorite third base play here tonight, since there's about 12 of them that we could play. But he's playable in stacks. Dylan Moore is back. He's always hit lefties pretty damn well himself, and so has A.J. Pollock. So they're going to go very right-handed heavy here tonight. If you want to get off of a little bit of this Luzardo at what's kind of an elevated price tag for sure and just play Paxton and eat it there, I think that's fine to do one kind of construction here, play a little short Rocky stack or a one-off or two against Paxson and then play Luzardo, or go the opposite way and play a, a short Mariner stack against Luzardo and then play Paxson. I think that's a fine construction, and you're going to get very low ownership on both Seattle and Colorado if you do that. So um, you could get to a chalkier offense. You could play play Boston. You know, if you play the Paxton angle with Seattle, uh, or you could play Texas, you could play, Tan you know, whatever you want to do. Uh, there's a lot of really interesting ways that you could structure things here tonight. I don't think any one of these starting pitchers is just a stone lock tonight because they all have weaknesses, uh, including Bryce Miller on the other side. 10,000 for him. Now, unfortunately, he hasn't been on the main slates um, over his last, what, three starts, actually. You know, we talked about, um, or four starts, maybe. Uh, we talked about starting to take shots against him when he got Atlanta, right? And and the price tag was up at 9,400. We mentioned once again that we we're going to take shots against him at a 10,100 when he got Oakland. He was very good in that outing, not so much in the outing against Atlanta. Struck out just four, gave up three runs in six and a third. He was still serviceable there. However, the wheels came off when he wasn't on the main slates, unfortunately, as we were kind of waiting for with him. 10-6... Uh, he was uh, against the Yankees, and he gave up eight earned runs in four and two-thirds, sprayed seven hits, struck out just three. Really torn apart in that outing, and sure enough, in the next outing, he got Texas, and he gave up seven earned in his last start in two and a third innings, struck out just two. So Bryce Miller here, um, you know, he started, the book is kind of circulating uh, around Major League Baseball on him now everybody's realizing that he doesn't really have all that overwhelming strikeout stuff. You know, the outings against Oakland, Houston, when they were striking out a lot, and Detroit in the early part of the season, and then Oakland again, were probably a little bit noisy. And when he gets a lower strikeout offense, like a Texas, um, or a, a Yankees, sure, then, you know, that, that makes things a, a little bit more uh, dicey for him. Same thing here, 10,000. I mean, he's not cheap. And this offense, we talked about this a little bit more recently. They're only striking out now against right-handers, 22.5%. This is an average figure, 93 WRC+. Plus. They've got Georgie Soler hitting the baseball over the wall against what seems like everybody now. 
uh, Luis Arias still hitting very close to 400 at the top of the lineup. Jesus Sanchez, Brian De La Cruz been back, been great. Jesus Sanchez is back. Garrett Cooper has shown a little bit of pop this season, more so than he has in years past. Um, I mean, Joey Wendell hit a ball out like yesterday or two days ago, I think. A um, couple guys down at the but like Gene Segura definitely hit a ball out. A couple guys down at the bottom of the lineup. Gene doesn't strike out. Um, you know, Jonathan Davis, he's been a great pickup for them. Nick Fortes has a little bit of upside from behind the plate. So this team is a little bit more difficult to go after than they were earlier in the season. And Bryce Miller's only striking out 18.5% of lefties here. And they're going to have probably three or four lefties in the lineup. Luis Arise, certainly, he strikes out, you know, enough for two or three lefties himself. Um, Jesus Sanchez, as I mentioned, is back. He's at 3,100. He'll be in the middle. And then they've got the Joey Wendell and, you know, whoever they bring in off the bench or whatever. Um, so a couple of these lefties here with hard contact numbers for Bryce Miller are in play. And because Luis Arise is a damn good hitter. Not a lot of power there, and you still got to pay 4900 for him, so not a, a favorite second base play for sure. And uh, unfortunately, the Miami is, is probably going to be well down the list for me today. I don't think we're going to get enough leverage stacking against Bryce Miller, but, I mean, his last two outings have really proved that um, you know, he's still got some holes here. And despite the fact that his control has been elite, he's been on the barrel at a full 10% with hard contact, 37.5 to both sides, giving up a 200 ISO to the lefties. And he'll continue to give up more and more power if the hard contact rate to the right side persists You know, to the righties as well. Just a 117 ISO so far, 24% K rate, that's nice. So he's got a little bit of strikeout upside here against Miami in that respect. But uh, I think we got a little bit of, um, you know, more regression coming for Bryce Miller here. However, does still have just a 57.5% strand rate. That number is likely to tick up. So I think we got some really short sample noise that we need to still let flesh out here. 10,000, I think it's a, it's okay. Um, I'm not jacked about paying this price. Uh, like, I'll be totally honest. I'd rather just pay another extra 300 for Logan Webb. But so with the field. And that's what's happening here. Just a 9% ownership rate coming in so far for Bryce Miller. This puts him in play if this number stays this low. He has the upside for 25 and 30. And on a seven-game slate, you might need to get different if you want to play Boston, Tampa, uh, or any of the other very popular offenses like Kansas City, Texas, Cincinnati. Um so I think he's in play, but I'm not super jacked about it because I still like taking shots against him. So I'm going to have some some Georgie Soler, some Brian De La Cruz, and some Jesus Sanchez for sure. These guys can hit the baseball over the wall. And if you want to get to a couple of really off-the-board full stacks, throw in Luis Arise because the guy's hitting 400. Um, and throw in a Garrett Cooper if you can make it happen at first base. You could really stomach that. He's 3,400. Go ahead. Or throw in a very cheap catcher, Nick Fortes, behind the plate, 32. That's fine, too as well. So uh, I think it's in play, the, my, the Marlins here, but I also like Bryce Miller a little bit. I think if I had to choose, I'd probably just side with Miller. Um, but man, I do not like this price tag up here for a very young arm. I'm looking for more regression for him to the downside. And I'm just not totally convinced that Miami is really the offense that can make that happen. They hit a lot of ground balls, um, though, and he's a fly ball pitcher here. So it's it's very well within range for the Marlins to get there. Uh, okay, I think that's it for the breakdown. Um, went pretty long once again, but uh, let's just kind of go over quickly a review here. Colorado and Boston, think everybody's kind of in play here to one degree or another. Packs in Boston, definitely. Um, they're your, your chalk arm and chalk offense of the day, but you can leverage that and play some of these young Colorado kids, in particular Zeke Tovar um, or uh, Brenton Doyle, something like that. Probably just one-offs here. No Connor Siebel for me. San Francisco and St. Louis, Logan Webb, I like a, a pretty decent bit. Matt Libertor, eh, only if the ownership just totally tanks um, would I consider going after San Francisco here. But he's at a fine 6400 I think it's a playable price tag. Um, I'm kind of off of St. Louis here. I don't like going after Logan Webb in general. They're a really, really off-the-board tournament stack, so sure, go ahead on a seven-game slate if you want. But no thank you for me. Um, 
But I do like the Giants here going after Libertor. He gives up a, a bit too much contact. Not going to throw it past a lot of these Giants. I think it's a fine batted ball matchup. Angels, Texas. Love Texas here. Uh, and and a good bit of Dane Dunning as well. I think he's the most playable down in the in the low 6Ks. No Tyler Anderson for me whatsoever. And I think getting to some coverage stacks against what's likely to be increasing ownership on Dane Dunning throughout the day with the Angels, I think that's playable construction for sure. Cincinnati I like a uh, little bit. A little bit more than usual in stacking against Zach Greinke. I'm not crazy about full stacks here because um, I just hate stacking against him. He, he's a very serviceable arm still. And that puts him in play at 7,000 flat. Luke Weaver also in play, 7,500, serviceable because the Royals are terrible. Uh, but literally every all sides here are in play and pretty much every, every one of the players too. Tampa and Oakland, mostly just Tampa here, but you can have some Oakland pieces once again going after a very expensive Zach Eflin. I, don't, I think he's overpriced. Um, in general for his skill set. Not overpriced for the, the matchup, of course, uh, but we might be seeing a little bit kind of outsized ownership here. I don't know, Seems something seems fishy here for me. So I might have some Oakland pieces because they're insanely cheap. Tampa on the other side, definitely. If you want to stack this game, I don't think that's a bad construction, to be quite honest. Philly and Arizona, I really like this game for tournaments. If you can make really good constructions happen, uh, I'm fully on board with it. Um, I think both Dylan Covey, who's not here in the list, and Tommy Henry are very much attackable with these offenses, and I want to go after that. These are two really good upside spots, and Arizona is a damn good baseball team, man. And Miami and Seattle, maybe some short Seattle stacks to get off of some Jesus Luzardo ownership, but I think I'd prefer him in tournaments to James Paxton. I uh, trust him a little bit more, and I think Seattle is a little bit worse than some of these young righties that Colorado is going to throw at Paxton. Um, yeah, I don't know. It, it's basically a wash, you know, be, between all these guys. Bryce Miller in play, of course, as we, as we just talked about, as are a couple of Miami pieces here or there. So a lot of things you can get to here on a, on a full seven game main slate, but I hope that, um, that kind of breakdown gives you an idea as to where to start, uh, when you are building your teams. So once again, keep an eye out for projections and ownership updates all throughout the day as we will push them. As soon as lineups and et cetera start rolling in. So good luck to everybody here on this Monday 7 Gamer.